Welcome. Good morning. Let me. All right. Get ready for 60 minutes of talking. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Let me get this. Okay, it's up. All right. To open, I, I humbly make a land acknowledgement. I would like to recognize and acknowledge the indigenous people of this land, the Lenny Lape, the Shawnee, and I'm going to say this wrong, Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, that is the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Seneca, Cayuga, Tuscarora. We gather to, uh, to, today on Joan de Ogant and Onondaga, <laughs> or Seneca word for Pittsburgh, or between the two rivers, the Welle, uh, the Welle, Wellick Hane, and the Minanagila. These are Lenape words for the, for the two rivers that converge here, which translate to the best flowing river of the hills and where the banks cave in and erode. Where the land, while the land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important social justice and decolonial practice that promotes indigenous visibility and a reminder that we are on indig settled indigenous lands. Let this land acknowledgement be an, an opening for all of us to contemplate a way to join in decolonial and indigenous movements for sovereignty and self-determination. Lastly, I'm grateful to Melissa Borgia-Aski and, and Sandy Dowdy for valuable etymological and pronunciation help with this, even though I'm still need, needing more tutoring on that. Also, I uh, thank Andrea R um, Riley Amukovitz and the American Indian Caucus for helping me with this land acknowledgement and providing the convention and hopefully future conventions with similar language for all of us to use in our sessions this year. Now, I must prepare everyone for what I'm about to say. The message I offer comes from a deep sense of love and compassion for everyone who makes the sacrifices it takes to teach writing and rhetoric in our world today. I know you are good people. And because I love you, and I will be honest with you, but it may hurt. I promise you it hurts not because I've done something wrong, but because I'm exposing your racial wounds. These wounds are the precursors to the killing referenced in my title. I also ask many of you to be patient as I first address my colleagues of color. But the fact that I must ask you to be patient, to do this is evidence of the white supremacy that we all, that we um, even conscientious teachers of writing are saturated in. My colleagues of color, to you I wink and nod. We will break the steel cage of white supremacy of white racial bias, of the many bars. Don't worry about all the details. It's just their vision. It's just there so you don't look at me. <laughs> of the, like the physical bars of the jails and prisons that house the 2.3 million US inmates, 67% of which are our brothers and sisters of color, yet we make up only about 37% of the US population. I know I don't need to tell you this. You know it with black men being jailed at rates five times that of their white peers, and Latinos at twice the rate of whites. It's likely that some of us know friends and family members who have had physical cages placed around them. We academics of color in this room have many things in common with the US prison population, one being the steel cage of racism. There we go. The cages are also figurative no less real in their effects. Michelle Alexander uh, recounts Iris Mar uh, Marion Young's metaphor for oppression, applying it to the racism that causes such incarceration rates, among many other injustices. I add to this list the way we judge, assess, give feedback to, and grade writing by, um, by students of color in our classrooms. Yes, the way we judge language form some of the steel bars around our students and ourselves. We too maintain white supremacy even as we fight against it in other ways. We ain't just internally colonized, we're internally jailed. As Alexander reminds us, and we likely feel each day, the overdetermined nature of racism explains why we can change or eliminate one unfair thing in a system or school or classroom like our curriculum or our body's presence, 
yet still find um, that our students of color struggle and fail even when we are, are there to help them, showing them that others like them have made it. We hold up the flag of opportunity and say, please, don't give up. Follow me. But we in this room made it despite the system, not because of it. Yet we are part of the system now. We are the, um, are the expect, um, exceptions that prove the rule, as Victor Villanueva has told us. We are contradictions. Again, my colleagues of color, I don't need to tell you this. You live it. But sometimes we have to remind ourselves of the magnitude of shit, that we are not oppressed alone. We need to commiserate together here in this place because often we may be alone at our own home institutions. We need to lament together. Of course, I commiserate with you today in the presence of white people. So there are other reasons I remind you about the steel cage of racism. We should lament together. It builds coalitions among the variously oppressed, such as our LGBTQIA colleagues, many of whom are white. The metaphor of the cage of races reminds me of the famous iron cage metaphor coined by Max Weber in 1905. The term is in, in German he used was Stalhatze Gehörse. I'm not, I don't know German very well, so I hope I got that right. Um, which was translated into in, in English as iron cage, but has also been translated as shell as hard as steel. What Weber was um, explain, uh, describing was the way in which capitalist societies, particularly in the U.S., with its strong Protestantism, uh, created conditions in which people self-govern their actions and beliefs, even their desires, through overdetermined structures in the market economy. This is due to the fact that no matter what you as an individual believe or do, you always are implicated and circulate in market economies that dictate the nature of the cage around you. That is, dictate your own self-governance, your boundaries and desires. You are always beholden to the market. The market I call your attention to today is the market of white language preferences in schools. Although it is also not hard to find connections between it and the flows of capital. I, I am overly simplifying Weber, but I call his ideas to your attention, my colleagues of color, because many white folks wish to make the racist problems we experience, like prison and educational racism and the white bias of those systems, as about something else, about mostly economics, laziness, or bad values. But these are interconnected and intersectional dimensions. In fact, Ronald Takaki calls on Weber's iron cage metaphor to highlight both the steel cage of racism and of what he terms republicanism, which is another way of saying American whiteness. Even as US academics, or us academics um, and teachers of color are trapped in cages of such American whiteness ourselves. And if we're going to talk about cages and racism, we should remember the first published instance of cages of racism. In Paul Lawrence Dunbar's 1899 poem, Sympathy, the bird sees the bright sun, the grass, the stream, but it cannot fly. It's caged, beating bloody wings against the bars, singing not of joy or glee, but a plea. The poem's narrator, perhaps Dunbar himself, ends, I know why the cage bird sings. While they are both speaking of the black experience in the US, Maya Angelou's famous poem, inspired by Dunbar's, explains the context for the cage of racism that we, all people of color, feel around us all the time, but not in the same ways, that context is excuse me, is white bias, or Takaki's cage of republicanism. Only Angelo's whiteness in the poem is that, is that which is not the cage. It is the market that makes up v um, Weber's Stalhatza Gehuza, his shell as hard as steel. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade wind soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. Who has been allowed to name people, places, things, the processes of writing and revision, theories of rhetoric? Who has named your sky? Who has named your writing, my friends? Who has named your pedagogies? Who has named your ways of judging language, my colleagues of color? The bird sings 
with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the cage bird sings of freedom. A fearful trill that is longed for still, that is freedom? What does it mean for you, my colleagues of color, to sing your freedom in your classrooms, your scholarship, your pedagogies? Is, is it the freedom from white naming that is such a thick part of our disciplines, histories? Is it freedom from white habits of language that cover us all? Is it freedom from white language supremacy? Again, I know many of you are also doing this work, speaking these truths. I have heard and seen you do so. I have seen white people around you smile at your words, then not take them, turn and go into their white world, a world that rewards them for their silence and hesitation. I thank you my brothers and sisters of color. And I stand here today asking everyone to listen, to see, to know you as you are, to stop saying shit about injustice while doing jack shit about it. Right. <laughs> we, <laughs> we all need, we are all needed in this project, this fight, this work, these labors. But because most in the room in our disciplines are white, I have to speak to them too many of whom sit on their hands with love in their hearts, but stillness in their bodies. Let us have tough compassion for our white colleagues. They don't have here the years of anti-white language supremacy training that we do. They've been paid off too many times to even recognize the bribes. Many even think they earned the bribes they take. It is their wages, as David Rodiger says. It is the wages of whiteness. They've never lived in the same worlds we have, not really, and it ain't all their fault. But finding fault ain't the point. Change is, revolution, reconciliation, redemption. My colleagues of color, I hope I offer you fuel, words of charcoal and fire to go back to your schools and institutions and make things burn. Melt the steel bars of racism and white language supremacy in your places so please know, I'm speaking with you, my colleagues of color. You are with me. You too sp are speaking, have spoken. Now, let me ask the white folks in the room a question. When I addressed only my colleagues of color just a minute ago, how did you feel? How did it make you feel in your skin to be excluded? How did it feel to be talked about and not talked to? to <laughs> <laughs> to be the object of the discussion and not the subject. How does it feel to be the problem? How does it make you feel to be the one in the way of progress? No matter what you have said or what your agendas are, how hard you worked or how sincere you are, it's unfair, isn't it? You are good people and yet you are the problem but you don't want to be. Think about that for a minute. You, you can be a problem even when you think, even when you try not to be. Sit and lament in your discomfort and its sources. Search. It's our goal, if, if, it is, if our goal is a more socially just world, we don't need more good people. We need good changes, good structures, good work, that makes good changes, structures, and people. Are you uncomfortable yet? Do you feel misunderstood? Are you thinking, he's not talking about me, he's speaking of those other white folks, the less conscious ones, right? Are you thinking, I know he ain't talking about me because I use the word woke. <laughs> but I am talking about you, all of you. No white person escapes it. And because I'm often racially ambiguous, I cannot exclude myself either. In the right light, I can be white. Even if I don't get all the privileges and that that habitus or that set of dispositions is meant to confer in our society. So I'm not going to tell you that you are going to be all right. I'm not going to say that you, white folks in the room here, the good white folks in the room, are the special ones. You thinking you're special is the problem. It always has been. Because you, white people like you, just like you, who came before you, have had most of the power. 
decided most of the things, built the steel cage of white language supremacy that we exist in today, but in and outside the academy. And likely, many of you didn't know you did it. You just thought you were doing language work, doing teaching, doing good work, judging students and their languages in conscientious and kind ways, helping them, preparing them, giving them what was good for them. Just as it is unfair that in our world, most indigenous Latinx and black Americans will never get the chance to do what we do, to be teachers or professors or researchers or something else that taps their own potentials because of the racist steel bars set around them, it's equally unfair that you perpetuate racism and white language supremacy not just through your words and actions, but through your body in places like this or in your classrooms, despite your better intentions. Let me repeat that to compassionately urge you to sit in some discomfort. White people can perpetuate white supremacy by being present. You can perpetuate white language supremacy through the presence of your bodies in places like this. Now, that feels really unfair to say so bluntly, doesn't it? You perpetuate white language supremacy in your classrooms because you are white? and stand in front of students, as many white teachers have done before you, judging, assessing, grading, professing on the same kinds of language standards, standards that came from your group of people, it's the truth. It ain't fair, but it's the truth. Your, bodies per per your body perpetuates racism just as black bodies attract unwarranted police aggression by being black. Neither dynamic is preferred, neither are right, but that's the shit, the steel cage that we're in. The sooner we can accept that fact, the sooner we can get to cutting those bars. Now, I'm not saying you need to leave. Far from it. We need you. My white colleagues, we need you. This is the elephant in the room, and it's big and white, and it obscures everyone's view, and we all need to see it in order to see around it. <laughs> and it gets in the way of understanding our practices of language as a weapon that we use against our students. So what does any of this have to do with answering my question, how do we language so people stop killing each other? I'm trying to set up the problem of the conditions of white language supremacy, not just in our society and schools, but in our own minds, in our habits of mind, in our dispositions, our bodies, our habitus in the discursive, bodily, and performative ways we use and judge language. This means many of us can acknowledge white language supremacy as the status quo in our classrooms and society, but not see all of it, and so perpetuate it. I'm trying to explain the conditions in our classrooms that cause your judgments to be weaponized as a white teacher, or even a teacher of color, who must take on a white racial habitus to have the job you have. It takes conditions of white language supremacy to make our judgments about logic, clarity, organization, and conventions a hand grenade with the pen pulled. All we have to do is give it to another and let go of the hammer. These judgments, these standards seem like, just, like they're just about language, just about communication, just about preparation for the future, just about good critical thinking and communi communicating. Here's a hint. When we start qualifying our ideas with words like just, we're trying to convince ourselves of the lies we are telling. We are trying to convince ourselves of a diminished sense of the power and significance of rhetoric, of words, of language. So back to my title. It comes from Mayor Rose O'Reilly's invocation of Iyab Hassan's question. Hassan was an Arab American literary theorist born in Egypt, which I believe made him a his asking of the question quite l real, not figurative or imaginative. O'Reilly's short 1989 article in which, which she offers the question is a kind of rumination on her teaching life to that point, where, where, uh, which began in the 1960s. So how do we language so people stop killing each other? The practice of languaging are fundamentally practices of judging. What is really, what, what is reading rhetorically or considering the rhetorical situation or for a re writer or speaker, if not a series of judgments? In a world of police brutality against black and brown people in the US, of border walls 
and regressive and harmful immigration policies that traumatize and separate children from parents, of increasing violence against Muslims and LGBTQIA, of women losing their rights to control their own bodies, of overt white supremacy on US streets, of mass shootings in schools, of, the con of conscious poisoning of black and brown people's communities, of a complete disregard of indigenous people's rights to their la lands and cultures, of blatant refusals to be compassionate to the hundreds of thousands of refugees around the world, where do we really think this violence, discord, and killing starts? What is, the na what is the nature of the ecologies in which some people find it necessary to oppress or kill others who are different from them, who identify or think or speak or worship or love differently than them? All of these decisions are made by judging others by our own standards and inevitably finding others wanting, deficient. People who judge in these ways lack practices of problematizing their own existential situations and lack experience sitting in the discomfort that that problematizing brings. They lack an ability to sit with paradox, guilt, pain, and blame and make something else out of it. Again, let me compassionately urge you to sit in discomfort. If you use a single standard to grade your students' languaging, you engage in racism. You actively promote white language supremacy, which is the handmaiden to white bias in the world, the kind that kills black men on the streets by the hands of the police through profiling and good old fashioned racism. So how do we, English and literacy teachers judge language so people stop killing each other? I have argued that, la that labor-based grading contracts explicitly address in writing classrooms the problem of grading locally diverse students the paradox of teachers who are by necessity steeped in a white racial habitus, steeped in white language bias already, while many of their students are not, a white racial bias that if you are white, you cannot probably fully see, hear, or feel. The social world has not trained you to do so. Yet, it is the source of your privileges, likely part of the reason you're, you are in front of the class in the first place. If we can confront such paradoxes in our judgments of language, in our habitus, then maybe some of the killing might stop. But first, we have to painfully reconcile our habits of judgment. And that means painfully reconciling the paradox between ourselves and our actions. As Bourdieu's term habitus makes clear, one's judgment is not simply one's own individual judgment of something. It's never simply an individual practice. It is consubstantial, interconnected to the social world we live in. As many of you know, in Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, problem-posing education moves through a process of listening uh, to the community outside of the classroom, identifying problems and, uh, or issues in, in, the, uh, in dialoguing with, with student participants using codes or cultural artifacts that embody language, such as media, newspaper articles, TV shows, movies, etc., that represent many sides of the problem or issue, that reveal the problems as paradoxes. From these codes, participants again listen carefully to them in order to describe what they see, hear, and feel, offering their own experiences that relate to those codes, questioning the codes, and of course, moving to articulate things to do as a response. This means that problem posing is an ongoing process of interrogating the paradox of judgment, how we see, hear, or feel, how we language the world into existence, how we are simultaneously right and wrong, and how that languaging makes and unmakes us simultaneously. Put another way, our personal choices and judgments of our students both personal, are, are both personal and a part of larger social disciplinary structures that, are, that also form the boundaries within which we act and judge. Raymond Williams describes this dynamic as simultaneously a setting of limits and an exertion of pressures in a particular direction. So part of being a woke writing teacher, then, is a constant posing of problems about my own existential writing assessment situation, a continual articulating of paradoxes in my judgment that complicates how I make judgments, how I read and make meaning of the symbols my students give me and that I give back to them. And you can't see the last thing. It should say white language supremacy underneath. But to, <laughs> let's see. Uh, how white language supremacy places limits on and pressures me 
despite my efforts to counter such things, just as they do my students. To see such paradoxes in how we judge is to see through the natural or to see things that are natural as paradoxes, thus not natural at all, but contrived by determined systems and choices. And in our classrooms, journals, committee rooms, and writing standards, what do you think the natural is? What have you left unquestioned about your ways of judging language or students? Do you think that white racial habitus, that the historical white language biases in our disciplines and lives have affected these places? Or the building of something like the framework for success in post-secondary writing, or our pedagogies, or our own ways of judging student writing? What you see and can see as clear, effective, and compelling do you think you're special, immune to biases? Let's look at one sacred cow in our discipline. What do you think the habit of mind that the framework calls metacognition is and looks like in students in your classroom? How do you evaluate it or grade it? Where did you get those ideas? Think about two or three writers or texts that have markers of such a habit of mind, perhaps ones you might show as examples and as such a practice. Where did, you get, where did those writers and texts get their habits from? Their dispositions to do this exemplary work? How might you characterize those writers or their texts performative, bodily, and discursive dispositions? Did they magically escape the white biases in their worlds or educations? Were they the exceptions? Are they special? What I like about the framework is its de-emphasis on hierarchy and ranking performances that fall within any given habit of mind, but is that how departments and programs use the framework? Or do they use it to dismantle hierarchies within student social formations? Or is it just a pedagogy that, and not an assessment philosophy? Not a philosophy that structures the way you judge grade writing in your classrooms, the way you dole out opportunity. Do you still have a standard next to the framework? Is the framework being used as a method to, to get students to write white? but not used to attend to ever, the ever-widening universe of reflexive or reflective discourses. But white language supremacy has crafted the framework in more insidious ways. This makes the framework's presence still dangerous if we don't see it for what it is. As I'm sure most of you know, we live in a deeply segregated society. The Washington Post's May 2018 story shows maps from de demographic data illustrating just how segregated by race we are. Here's the city we live in. The red dots are white residents, the blue um, black residents, the, the downtown area where the three rivers converge is a white center of commerce and tourism, the business district, the heart of a white supremacy. That's where we are, the place where they make the steel bars. Let's not forget that. And when you go to dinner tonight or you, you move from session to session, notice who serves you, who picks up after you, or fills water containers in the white center. How are we not in this steel city in a steel cage of white supremacy? So the, the 23 good smart members of the team that created the framework were mostly white and were produced by such a segregated society, like all of us. Let me dramatize this for you. Here's the framework's task force. Where do you think these folks learned their languaging? Who do you think most, most or all their friends were in school? What schools do you think they went to? Now, I don't know the answers to these questions for these individuals, but I do know the patterns in the US where, which they cannot escape. If you're white, you kick it with white people. If you're black, you kick it with black people, but you may work with white people. It may seem melodramatic to show all these white faces when I could have just told you that 18 or 19 of the members of the framework's designers were white. It may appear that I'm pointing fingers at individuals unnecessarily, calling out people for things they do not control. It, if you think that, you're missing the point. You are feeling your white fragility. I ask you compassionately, notice your white fragility. The point is the inevitable and embodied whiteness. It can be very visceral, thick in the air for us people of color. I need you to feel how whiteness and good-hearted, smart people like these folks who do great work can fill a room with their whiteness to the point that the one or two people of color in the room can feel suffocated. I want you to feel how a good group of folks like this can silence the few bodies of color in the room 
and never examine their own habits of judgment, then canonize those white habits as simply habits of everyone's mind. I want you to see how this steel bar is installed in the cage of white language supremacy that imprisons us all. But there's more. White language supremacy also looks like this. The four authors of the article in College English that explains the process and the framework were all white women. To the leaders of the task force credit, who are the authors of this article, they point to the place one can find all the task force members and their bios, a website. The paradox in this is that Peggy, Linda, Anne, and Kathy do not control their whiteness, but they do control how it's deployed, how they make it visible and the privileges of leadership it conveys to them. This is not to say they have not worked hard or deserve credit for their work, or even that the work they did isn't good work. It is to say that problematizing their own whiteness should reveal this kind of painful paradox, that good work done by conscientious white people can still kill people of color by codifying white language supremacy. The presence of their white bodies perpetuates historical racial injustices. Damned if they do, damned if they don't. There are no easy way outs of the steel cage of white language supremacy. How do we check this in our lives? One key practice is problematizing, in problematizing is deep listening. It anchors everything in the process. We cannot problem pose without deep listening. Krista Radcliffe named a similar cross-cultural practice, rhetorical listening, as a response to Jacqueline Jones Royster's Four Seeds Address. Royster asks us, I get that? There we go. Um, Royster asks us, how do we listen? How do we do more than talk back? How do we exchange, negotiate, and collaboratively create perspectives, meaning, and understanding? Radcliffe offers a way that centers on acknowledging whiteness and listening deeply to others, or consciously, this is, these are her words, consciously standing under discourses that surround us and others, letting them wash over through and around us, and then letting them lie there to inform our politics and ethics, end quote. These listening practices are important, but let's not forget that Radcliffe is a critical white academic who realizes she must listen likely because that is not the habit of language most white academics practice, particularly white males. The we and us is white, as white teachers and academics. The other side to this practice is the body of color talking, being heard by the white listener, Royster being heard, listened to by Radcliffe. Ten years after O'Reilly wrote the article from which I derive my title, she revised her teaching um, in Radical Presence, teaching us contemplative practice. In that book, she describes the practices of deep, of deep listening in her uh, classroom, concluding that one can, I think, these are her words, Listen someone into existence. Encourage a stronger self to emerge or a new talent to flourish. It's attractive, isn't it? But wait, doesn't it reenact a whitely stance of control and agency? Who's doing the making here? The teacher listening her students into existence? It's Pygmalion all over again. It's the whitely Rex Harrison languaging Audrey Hepburn into existence when we know Ain't nothing wrong with Audrey, but Rex's judgments. This isn't quite what Royster, I think, had in mind. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk and longtime social justice activist, bases most of his teachings about peace on a kind of deep listening, or as I prefer to think of it, a deep mindful attending to the other in our presence. This reveals listening as limited, I think, as it is only an auditory metaphor. Attending is more holistic and embodied. Han reminds us that every person has a suchness that can be understood and attended to on the other's terms. He explains, if we want to live in peace and happiness with a person, we have to see the suchness of that person. We have to understand others without trying to control or change them. Come on. There we go. In fact, love and understanding or deep attending are the same for Han, and to practice it, one must ask the other for help. We cannot do it alone. I'm, ta I'm taken particularly by his suggested practice. Han says, sit close to the one you love, hold his or her hand, and ask, do I understand you enough? Or am I making you suffer? Please tell me so that I can learn to love you properly. 
Imagine this kind of assessment practice in your classrooms with your students. Assessment might be a problem-posing process that continually attends to the questions like, do I understand you enough? Am I making you suffer? Please help me to read your languaging properly. What strikes me about deep attending is its compassion and its potential for growing the patience in all of us that is needed when we confront students who are different from us, who do not look or sound or come from the same places as we do. Deep attending also opens space for those of us who have only been listening but would like to speak and be heard. But I'm sure all of us would say that we listen or attend to our students carefully already. So I reiterate and reframe Royster's questions. How are you attending exactly? What are the markers of your compassionate attending? How is your attending a practice of judgment that your students can notice? How is it a practice that recognizes their existence without overly controlling them? I hope you can hear the structural of what I'm asking. How do we language so people stop killing each other? Part of my answer is that some must be silent, leaving enough space between utterances so that problematizing can happen. I'm not saying we have to change our perspectives, or soften our hearts. Our hearts are not the problem. In fact, I'm actually saying the opposite, that we cannot change our biases in judging so easily, and that your perspectives that you've cultivated over your lifetime is not the key to a more just society, classroom, pedagogy, or grading practice. The key is changing the structures, cutting the steel bars, altering the ecology in which your biases function in your classrooms and communities. I'm saying we must change the way power moves through white racial biases, through standards of English that make white language supremacy. We must stop justifying white standards of writing as a necessary evil, even evil in any form is never necessary. We must stop saying that we have to teach this dominant English because it's what students need to succeed tomorrow. They only need it because we keep teaching it. I'd like to end with a parable. Let me end with a parable. I made it up, because <laughs> it suits my purpose. Um, you are tired and starving, on the verge of death, needing any kind of sustenance, walking on a road in a land of plenty. You've been walking for weeks. You come upon a house with a lush garden next to it, full of fruits and vegetables. You knock on the door, a man answers, and you beg, please, can you help me? I'm dying. I need some food. Anything you can spare, please help me. I'll tend to your garden. We can share the food with me. Now, the man has lived in this house his whole life. He's inherited it and the beautiful garden from his parents. In fact, he made it bigger and more fruitful. He worked hard at it and in it. He has so much, he has, he has so much now that he sells the excess. His house has become bigger. The man has lived his entire life with this beautiful, fruitful garden, tending it carefully, working hard in it. It is his, even though one cannot really own earth or pro products. Who can really own earth? It, has, it was here before the man and will be here after he's dead. But the illusion of possession is there because the garden has always been there for him, always served him and he has watered it with the language of possession. This is my garden, he says. I tend this garden. I own this garden. I have worked this garden. It grows for me. Its bounty is mine. So when you come to his door and ask him for food, he feels uncomfortable. He's never really had to share. It's, in fact, he kind of feels that sharing may not help you. How will you know the benefits of laboring in your own garden? Charity won't get you your own garden, will it? So he says, I'm sorry. I really do understand how, you, how hungry you are, how tired, how much you need food right now to live, but I don't feel comfortable giving you my food. I've never had to do that before. I want to help you in the right way. And that takes time to know. It will take time. So please, come back tomorrow, maybe then I'll be ready to share my food. What a blind sense of privilege it is to tell a starving person at your doorstep, in, your, in a house of plenty, in a land of abundance, that you just don't feel, yet feel comfortable enough to share your food. 
It isn't just that in the fable, the man's privilege allows him to make a decision based on his own self or sense of comfort or selfish sense of readiness or that he feels he knows the best timetable for helping the other in his, in his midst. The deeper, more galling problem here is that his comfort comes at the cost of your pain. The deeper problem is that you, the starving person at the doorstep, cannot wait. You're fucking starving. And the man with plenty asks from his privileged position to wait. Come back tomorrow, please. My comfort and readiness to give, he implicitly says, is more important than your safety or health. Now, my fable isn't meant to offer lessons about helping others or being compassionate, although one could hear those lessons. It's meant to be an allegory for how we make decisions as, writer, as writing and literacy teachers, particularly about classroom grading and assessment practices, about how we use a particular dominant white standard. It's about the, our decisions to continue to reinforce white language supremacy in our classrooms that give many of us power over students while we tell our students how much right they have to their languages, how much we care and embrace the diversity of languages that they bring and use, yet we tacitly contradict these messages by asking them to wait just a bit longer for us to feel comfortable enough to change our classroom practices, to change the way standards work against them despite the linguistic truths we know about the communicative effectiveness of all languages. We delude ourselves by saying that it's what others less enlightened than us will judge their languaging on, so we must use dominant standards today, thinking that our soft words and kind eyes and good intentions will solve the pain and harm and erasure that the, that the use of a single universal standard inflicts. We act as if we have no power whatsoever in changing language judgment practices. Us, language teachers and researchers, have no power with language. Our decisions to not build more radical anti-racist and anti-white language supremacist assessment ecologies in our classrooms often are based on our own selfish sense of comfort, selfish senses of not, not being ready to share our gardens. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard writing teachers, ones who are conscientious, critical, and experienced, say to me, I'm just not ready. I don't feel comfortable yet. Maybe next semester. What a blind sense of privilege. What a lack of compassion. If compassion is more than feeling empathy, but a doing of something, a suffering with others. What a lack of asking the deep, attending, and problematizing question, am I causing you to suffer? Many of your students of color, your students who do not embody enough of the white um, habits of language that make up your standards, stand at your classroom doors and die for your comfort. Die as they wait for you to, to, to be ready. I realize that it may sound as if I'm being overly dramatic and using a flawed metaphor. Our students of color, for instance, are not linguistically starving. We need nothing given to us to be effective language users. We already are and always have been. We are Eliza Doolittle speaking well. Food is not a metaphor for language in my parable. It is a metaphor for power. People of color have never controlled the standards in schools or disciplines. Standards of English have never come from us unless we allowed ourselves to be colonized. And let's not fool ourselves. All teachers of color are colonized to some degree, even for those who resist that colonizing. Being colonized is how you get to be teachers of color. That's why color is added to the term. It's a shitty compromise. It's a shitty compromise to sacrifice some bit of your body, to cut out a part of your tongue, to let some of your soul wink out of existence in order to live, prosper, or make change in the world for those who come after you. So don't get hung up on the nuances of the allegory. Food in the story is not language. It's power. The power to judge and make and or control standards. The point is a Marxian one. Who owns the means of opportunity production in the classroom? We all may hate it, but most of us are still required to give grades. And those are the keys to opportunity. Just because our students of color are linguistically rich does not mean that by default those riches can be exchanged in your classroom economies if the economy is not set up to accept those riches. Some of your students may be starving with pockets and purses full of useless coins in the bustling market of your classrooms because you don't accept their money, even though you tell them how valuable it is. Hold on to it, you say. 
It's your identity, your heritage. But everywhere we go, those heritage coins ain't worth shit in the white economies of the academy and marketplace. So, so you tell them, you got to exchange that currency, code switch. But we tell you, I don't have access to the money changer. And he charges interest and that I cannot afford. That the value, there's some value lost in the exchange. And you say, try anyway. Am I being overly dramatic with this parable, with this talk? Are, the, are your students really dying in front of you? Do we students, teachers, and academics of color really cut out a fleshy chunk of our tongues just to have the pleasure of pretending to be the equals of whites in the academy? Do the vast majority of you do harm by using a single standard of English to assess and grade your, your classrooms all the while patting yourselves on the backs for how good you are? How much you're helping your poor students of color? Does your dominant white set of linguistic habits of language kill people? Is your body in places, in the places you circulate, part of the problem of white language supremacy? This, I think, is the problematizing we must all do. Thank you and peace to you all. Thanks.